Hello, Carl. Hey, George. Hey, how are you doing? I am good. I'm good. How are you? Good, good. I wanted to congratulate you on your new book. Thank you so much. This is publication week, right? Yeah, well, and uh, congratulations on yours. I, I guess mine's coming out a little bit after yours. Yeah, almost exactly a month. In fact, I think I'm coming back from book tour while you're about <laughs> to set out, because I, <laughs> I keep seeing your name. Um, I was Last week I gave a reading at, um, at Kepler's in, mm-hmm. in Palo Alto. Or I guess that's actually Menlo Park, but out by Stanford, and they said, "Oh yeah, Carl Zimmer's coming in a few weeks." And yep. then I yep. saw your name again. Oh, this week I gave a reading at the Harvard Bookstore, <laughs> and I saw you there in the window, just two slots under me. I'm stalking you. <laughs> and I think you're going to be in Seattle just after I am for this uh, Seattle Science Series. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. Wow. So we're that's good. Yeah, so I just got back. I was in... Um, you must be York. exhausted. I've been getting some very weird venues that I never would have expected. Like, uh-huh. um, the What Do You Know show with Michael Feldman. Oh, that is weird, yeah. Yeah, and then on How'd Wednesday... that go? Oh, that was good. Yeah, we talked for about a half an hour. And I was afraid I'd have to answer those those ridiculous quiz questions. But it wasn't anything like that. Oh. I was talking about <laughs> On Wednesday, I did the Colbert Report. You did? I did. Star! Way to go. I actually, uh, I I created uh, electrical sparks of many thousands of volts and got Stephen Colbert to touch the probe and shock himself. (laughs) I'll have to get, uh, I'll have to, I, I... I'll have to like promise to uh, you know get them infected with some nasty strain of E. coli to get that That'd attention. That'd be perfect. Yeah, you could have a, you could have a vial and then yeah. hold it up and <laughs> here, drink this. Yeah, yeah, it, it was definitely definitely a trip. I, my wife watches the show and once she called me in because Stephen Pinker was on it. Mm-hmm. My, my reaction was, God, what's Stephen Pinker, this respectable Harvard scientist, doing on the show? You know, subjecting himself to to ridicule, and, and then my <laughs> wife said, uh, "Well, you know, what if it comes down to you being invited to go on Colbert to promote your book? Would you mm-hmm. do it?" And I thought about it and said, "Well, yeah. The sad thing is, I probably would." <laughs> but what <laughs> is the sad thought experience? In a million years, they'd ask me. It was great, actually. Yeah, there you yeah. go. Colbert's a real gentleman off screen, and then of course he emphasizes that he's there's two Stephen Colberts. The real one who's this very intelligent nice person and then the the Stephen Colbert he plays on TV so Mm -hmm. it it turned out to be a great experience and I'm really really glad that I didn't let my my apprehensions get in the way (laughs) but anyway the most exciting thing that happened in New York was I was given a copy of Microcosm excellent yes because I you know I stopped by the publisher there and we have almost the same publisher all part of the Random House Empire. Yeah. I'm holding it up now. It's really a nice cover. Yeah, I was very pleased with that. The, yeah. The most so honest I, looking uh, picture dish you've ever seen. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really quite something. And I just wanted to say I started started reading it, um, you know, while I was was still in New York, and I just love that, um, your introduction. It's like a, a first this first-person essay about uh, holding up the Petri dish and, and it's just such a great way to get into the book and how you use E. coli is, is like this protagonist to tell, you know, really, it's almost like a bird's eye tour of most of modern biology and this exploration of the boundaries between life and non-life. Yeah, I, I've been interested in, in just these big life questions for a while now, and, and I was uh, looking at some of the magazine articles I was writing and blog posts and things and just realizing that this was just something that was really on my mind and that the science had really uh, come to the point where you could actually uh, write some interesting things about it. But then I thought, okay, how how am I going to approach this? You know, what's going to be my guide? And then I I realized that uh, E. coli would be actually the, the perfect guide because it really, it's at the heart of, of modern biology. Yeah, it's, I mean, I, I sort of known that, but when you really see specifically how it plays a starring role in so many of the most important experiments in 20th century biology. Yeah, I mean, and I, I know how you, uh, uh, you have, 
admire beautiful experiments, and I was really um, struck by just how beautiful some of these early experiments in the 40s and the 50s with E. coli were, just in terms of um, just figuring out these incredibly fundamental questions with, you know, incredibly simple equipment, you know, just some bacteria in a Petri dish, you know, add some viruses, see if there's some clear spots appear in the dish, and then all of a sudden you're saying, hey, I think I know what genes are made of. Yeah, yeah, that, that what the uh, Hershey Hershey Chase experiment which, mm-hmm. is that the one they also call the wearing blender experiment? Um, well, they used the wearing blender as a centrifuge. A lot of these uh, a lot of these biologists who got Nobel prizes really liked to use wearing blenders in the in the forties <laughs> and fifties. It was like that was high tech. A wearing blender. I mean, literally, oh. like pull it out of the kitchen, bring it in the lab. See, uh, one of the things you can do with it is you can. Um, uh, you can let uh, E. coli, for example, have sex. And so what happens is that one of the bacteria is going to send out a big tube that's going to uh, hook up with um, another microbe, and they you will actually... You describe that very, very graphically in the book. <laughs> well, it's, a, it's, it's you microbe know... Microbe sex. It's microbe sex, yeah, and it, it's pumping DNA in there, and, uh, and it, it's a slow process, uh, they take their time, and so uh, what you can do is you can just throw these bacteria into a blender and switch on the blender, and you break apart uh, the bacteria, and uh, depending on how long you waited, uh, more genes or less genes are going to get from the donor to the recipient, and mm-hmm. you can test to figure out which genes made it over. So, for example, you might have a gene that helps with... Uh, resisting antibiotics and so you just mm-hmm. douse douse the bacteria with antibiotics and see you know who survives and who doesn't um, so oh. it's yeah so wearing blenders and and sex uh, it was a very um, very strange uh, way in which e, uh, e. coli helped, helped give birth to molecular biology yeah and it was a, a big surprise uh, to find out that they they actually had sex the e. coli so that well, was interesting. I mean, the, it's amazing to think that, I mean, a hundred years ago, people really weren't quite sure if bacteria were alive in the same sense yeah. that, uh, you know, we are or plants are. They were just... Yeah, you had a great line about that. They thought, they thought that they were featureless bags of goo. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> that's, that's really nice. Uh, so uh, it, it took a while to... Uh, to figure out that really they are a whole lot like us. I mean, down to these incredible details. And uh, the fact that uh, the fact that they had sex actually meant that they could figure out whether they had genes or not. Um, and and they did have genes, lo and behold. And their genes were made of DNA, like ours are. And their DNA gets uh, is used to build proteins in much the same way ours is, and so on and so yeah. forth. They just don't happen to be be um, in a nucleus, right? So our cells, mm-hmm. our cells ha- keep we keep most of our DNA packed up very tightly in this this nucleus, this little sac. Whereas uh, E. coli and other bacteria, they don't have nucleus, so the DNA is kind of floating out there. And um, again, this was another um, another case where um, E. coli and other bacteria got a bad rap because people just sort of thought of them uh, as keeping their DNA in there. It's been described as like a, like a bowl of tangled spaghetti. Oh. But, you know, you just think about it, like how, nothing could survive if it was just letting its DNA float around and get you know, tangled up and yeah. it would just be a mess. And yeah. so um, I write in part of the book about how E. coli, uh, people have been studying E. coli in particular just recently, actually, um, to figure this out, and they find these, this beautiful order within the cell. It's it's a it's a dynamic order. It's always changing, but it's mm-hmm. everything's always under control. So the DNA is is kept organized by these these sort of um, kind of like tweezer like proteins that clip different loops, and they open the loops up and close them. And and it's yeah, uh, amazing. To read it's about. just <laughs> it's just gorgeous stuff. Yeah, and yeah. If you're going from thinking of it as this as this structureless kind of blob, and then finding out that uh, you, you described it at one point as a, a geography of rhythms. Yeah, uh, because there are these 
there are all these these molecules that are, are giving it shape and giving it order, but they're moving all the time. And so, for example, um, there are uh, you know when E. coli grows, it's a rod kind of, and it, and it stretches out, and then it gets cut right in half, and boom, mm-hmm. then you have a couple um, uh, a, a couple uh, identical E. coli coming out of there. Um, so how do they cut it right in the middle? I mean, how does E. coli know to, to, to say, all right, this is where I'm going to make my cut? Uh, mm-hmm. And part of the way it does it is it has these molecules that spiral around back and forth along the length uh, of, of, this, of this microbe. Um, and they're spiraling along, but the thing is that they're, they're most often at either end because there are these other proteins that kind of are chopping them up along the way. And so there's... there's uh, not as much in the middle. So when it comes time to divide, the only place where some other proteins can attach is in the middle, because mm-hmm. these these this protein is bouncing around um, the whole the whole bacteria, and the middle is the easiest is the place where it is least often. Mm-hmm. So it's um, it's just made for you know computer visualization, special effects, because it's just it it's just mind blowing to, to to think about. Wow. It just kept striking me again and again how all the basic things in higher creatures are really going on in this little, little simple, simple organism. I mean, the simple unicellular. <laughs> it's just amazing. I mean, look, you know, just to take something like sex and it reduces it to its absolute bare bone minimum, which is yeah. you know extending a tube and squirting DNA <laughs> into another bacterium. Or, are you described? I mean, of course, there's not a nervous system per se and yet there's all this information processing going on like in, in the equivalent of a of a tongue yeah uh, it's, I'm not sure whether to call it a tongue or a brain or what but yeah, yeah, at, at yeah. the front end <laughs> it's amazing at the front end of, of you know one of these rods it's got thousands of receptors mm-hmm. and they can detect different kinds of, of molecules and mm-hmm. so there's they can sense oxygen and they can sense uh, different amino acids and and uh, various toxins and and they 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 can take in different signals at once and, and actually sort of process all that information um, mm-hmm. just with you know proteins that are floating around inside of it and they're they're doing these these computations and then um, and then that affects how they swim how they na- how they navigate around. Um, mm-hmm. So they can, in a sense, decide. You know, they're going to swim towards something good, or they're going to try to swim away from something bad. Yeah. So it is. It so it has the same purpose, or serves the same function as the nervous system, but it's reduced. You know, really again to the bare bones, to the molecular interactions, and rather than having organs. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it it, it just shows how you know if you if you just have um, certain kind of interacting parts, you know, they can be neurons or they can be these, these proteins that are, that are interacting, you can, you can um, respond to your environment. Um, yeah. You know, some people have even suggested that E. coli and other bacteria can actually um, kind of learn, but um, that seems pretty, pretty early days yet with that. But, yeah. um, but certainly they're, they're, um, the way they respond is, is just incredibly sophisticated and, um, what what I love is that you know engineers uh, are getting into the E. coli game because they look at the the sort of uh, the ways in which they process this information and the sort of the feedback loops they use to turn that into some kind of response and they're they're having you know some serious deja vu because you know E. coli is sort of is following some of the same principles that engineers use like when they build like a um, you know, an autopilot system for an airplane or something like that. Yeah. Boy, what an engineering feat it would be to reproduce something even a fraction as complex as an E. coli. Well, you know, there's some people trying to do it. There's this um, there's this movement to sort of create a complete full simulation of E. coli. Um, yeah, so that, that would be a computer simulation of its uh, metabolism? Of everything, theoretically, yes. um, you know, just but uh, it's it would be tricky because it would be like you know basically sixty million molecules all interacting. Uh, yeah. But this has been a dream of people who study E. coli for a long time. Um, Francis Crick, you know, one of the co-discoverers of the structure of DNA, 
uh, in the, um, I believe it was the late 60s, he started um, talking about how a special institution should be built just to uh, create what he called the complete solution of E. coli. Yeah. Um, wow. That never really happened, but, um, you know, there are definitely people who are trying to do that now. Um, yeah. And if you were to pick any organism to, to really simulate in fall, probably you'd want to choose E. coli because, you know, scientists know more about it, sort of proportionally speaking, than anything else. Anything. Uh, yeah, right. They know what most of its genes are for, roughly speaking. I mean, if you look at the human genome, it's it's such a mystery by yeah, comparison. Yeah, you know, this, this um, relationship between the, the, the bacteria and viruses was really, really fascinating, too. I, mean, I remember reading about all those old experiments with what they call phage, mm-hmm. bacteriophage, which are basically viruses that invade bacteria, right? Yeah. That, that invade, was invade, it sounds like, is not really the right word. Could you, could you talk a little about that? Some of the, I mean, that symbiotic relationship was, yeah. was really um, amazing. So, so viruses are actually uh, what... Uh, part of what put E. coli on the map because um, so uh, basically what happened was that that um, in the early part of the 1900s people discovered that E. coli was was could be killed uh, mm-hmm. and they and they they couldn't figure out what it was they could so they could create sort of a purified serum and, and apply it to E. coli and they would just wipe them out mm-hmm. and it took a long time to realize that bacteria get sick with viruses just like we do but um, you know whereas we get a cold and we blow our nose or whatever um, <laughs> if E. coli gets a bad virus it just it the virus you know makes thousands of copies inside of the microbe and then the microbe just basically bursts open um, <laughs> kind of yeah. ugly yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so have, you, have you seen that like under a or under a microscope? Yeah, or? yeah. You can, they're, they're taking pictures where you see these viruses just streaming out of E. coli, and, and you almost oh. feel sorry for the poor microbe. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and, they're, and the, these these particular viruses, some of them are just so cool. They look like uh, something out of the Matrix or something, and they have these sort of hexagonal-type heads and these, these kind of uh, screwdriver bodies and these weird things that look like legs, and they land on the bacteria and then drill in and pop in their DNA. So, um, yeah, and then the DNA actually becomes incorporated right. into the genome. And right. So, so you know, so people it. were able to, to, to infect E. coli and, and then to say, and to, to do experiments to figure out, well, what is the virus doing? How is, how is it making E. coli make more viruses? Yeah. And so that's how they were able to show, for example, that, um, that it's DNA that genes are made of, for example, by infecting, mm-hmm. one of the experiments was infecting E. coli. So, um, so anyway, so we think of viruses like, you know, a dreaded enemy that's going to kill us or whatever. Yeah, it's us uh, versus them. Yeah. <laughs> and it kind of is for E. coli, but then it kind of isn't. Because if, if you look, I mean, basically, um, there are a lot of viruses that can infect E. coli that carry genes that are actually really good for E. coli. Mm-hmm. So they may give E. coli... Um, Resistance to antibiotics, for example. I mean, those will be carried on a virus genome. Oh yeah. Or you know, they may they may carry um, genes that um, will turn E. coli into a, a parasite itself, turn it into a, a disease agent. You know, so now it can um, uh, inject things into cells or something like that. They they, yeah. they deliver all this equipment to E. coli. That's um, that can be good for it in a sort of an evolutionary sense. And they just sort of merge into, the, the virus kind of merges its DNA into the microbe's DNA, and they become one. But the mm. weird thing is that, that the virus can sort of pop out again after many generations and then move on to another host to infect it. And, you know, these mm. genes that they're carrying, they're constantly evolving, getting shuffled around in new combinations, new packages, so it it really um, yeah it, it really blurs a line between you know the host and, and the quote unquote parasite. Yeah, you think of an ecosystem as just kind of this big network where where nucleic acids being swapped around in different yeah. different combinations. Yeah. So if you look if you know if you look out at the ocean, I mean what you're really looking at is like a um, a whole like. Uh, 
highway system of viruses moving around between bacteria. I mean, that's mm. ultimately what the ocean is. It's this giant wow. <laughs> soup of shuttling DNA. Um, because wow. I, I read some unbelievable figure about how many times viruses are delivering DNA to bacteria in the ocean. And it's something like 10 to the 14th times a second. I mean, wow. just it's, it's a colossal thing. And, and it changes the way you think about evolution, too. Yeah, yeah. You don't, um, you know, you you can't think of evolution purely just as a tree of life. I mean, you have to think of it more as this kind of uh, web, you know, because genes are moving from between different species. E. coli yeah. has, you know, one strain of E. coli might have hundreds of genes that you don't find in any other strain of E. coli that they <laughs> they've picked it up, yeah, um, just from other species. Yeah, it's something to try to appreciate next time you have a really, really bad viral flu. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we can get viruses in our, our DNA, too. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. You know, it, it doesn't happen often, but over millions of years, it piles up. So we've got, mm-hmm. I, I think it's about like 100,000 pieces of DNA that came from different viruses that infected our, our ancestors in the past and got incorporated into the genome. And, and have some of these been, um, been been harnessed for, you know, our benefit? Uh, yeah, some of them have. Some of them have, have mutated and have ended up being incorporated, sort of domesticated, and, you know, we use use them. Like, there's there's one of them that, uh, that helps to build uh, the placenta. Mm-hmm. So it's involved in that. Um, oh. You know, a lot of them are just dead weight. A lot of them are just dead fragments of DNA that can't do anything anymore because they mutated to, until they're just useless. But they take up, yeah. um, I think, about 8% of our, our genome. So again, Is that what it, some of the junk DNA? Is that believed it, to be... Yeah, yeah, you know, viruses? yeah, it, it's, it's, yeah, what, what some people call junk, yeah. It, well, yeah I guess it's becoming to seem less and less junky all the time. Yeah, um, it's... Uh, well, yeah, it, it was the whole phrase of junk DNA was just sort of like this kind of offhand reference, and um, yeah, it's it's much more um, the, the the picture is much more interesting that now. So you have so for example a, a big so only two percent of of our DNA appears to be um, for encoding proteins. So you got yeah, the other ninety eight percent. That really surprised me when I read that. Yeah, I think that was like early on in your book, and uh, I hadn't appreciated. Yeah, so, it's, so, it's, yeah. So the rest of it is does what? Um, it's I'll, really not clear. The rest of well, yeah. I mean, this is, some of them. What they do is, I mean, uh, the classic thing that you learn in biology is that your cell reads a gene, a D, the DNA reads a gene, makes an RNA copy, which then gets used to build a protein. Yeah, well, actually, like sometimes... dogma. Right, right. Yeah. So, uh, a lot of the time, it, it appears, um, the cell is reading DNA, stretches of DNA, you could call them genes, I guess, but they're just making the RNA. They're not yeah. making them into proteins. Oh, yeah, there was something in the Times about that. You probably wrote it within <laughs> the last, <laughs> last few months about, uh, about how that works. Yeah, it wasn't yeah. me. I forget who that was. Yeah, so they make RNA for various signaling purposes, but not necessarily for transcribing, uh, transcribing between DNA and um, yeah. And protein. So, so some of this RNA can definitely do stuff like shut off other um, other genes um, or or let them switch on. Some of them just may just be just RNA that just like that just shoots out of, from the. From, from our DNA, and it just doesn't get used for anything, and then just gets cut up and recycled. It just, yeah. our cells are actually a little sloppier than we, we like to think. Yeah. Uh, so, but, but, uh, but what's neat is that E. coli has a lot of this kind of uh, shadow network of, of control as, as well. These, it, it, so e. coli also makes lots of RNA that is crucial for sensing things within the cell and, and controlling uh, the genes, you know, whether they get turned into proteins and so on. Yeah. So we're, you know, once it's one more way in which we're like E. coli. 
So with you know the the Jacob and Minot, they used E. coli to identify operons and yeah, and so that was a case of of the the DNA codes for a protein enzyme that uh, switches on or switches off another gene, but but in this case we're talking about RNA doing the doing the signaling directly. Right. So so this stuff with RNA that we were just talking about, how RNA itself can um, control. Uh, things in the cell. That's that's pretty. That's relatively new. But yeah. <clears throat> but what uh, what you were talking about was um, how these French researchers in the late 1950s uh, g- gave yeah. the first good answer to this basic question of you know how does how does a cell not use all its genes at once? I mean, right. when you think about it. We yeah. you know each of your cells has genes that could. In theory, you know, uh, make hair or or make hemoglobin or or make a, a, an enzyme for digesting food. So yeah. you know, it's, so if they're all on at once, it's <laughs> it'll be a it's big be a mess. Disaster. Yeah, yeah. No so life. what? So what? What gives that order? That kind of music yeah. to how genes work. And um, so what these scientists did was they looked at E. coli um, because it's. It was uh, simple enough and breed, breeds fast enough that uh, they could they could just ask questions and get good answers, you know, and not need to wait ten years for these things to to grow yeah. up. They they could yeah. just grow so fast. So what they did was they <clears throat> they were interested in how E. coli can eat uh, this sugar lactose, which uh, is what makes milk sweet, and. Um, you know they would they created mutants um, and that sort of digested lactose in a funny way. So, for example, normally E. coli uh, will, uh, if if you give it kind of a mix of lactose and a glucose, it'll just go for the glucose because it's mm-hmm. a it's a it's it's a better energy source, and E. coli would just sort of ignore the lactose in a sense. Yeah. Till the glucose is gone, and then it'll start gearing up and making all these enzymes to digest the lactose. Mm-hmm. So they found these mutants that just are always making the enzymes for digesting the lactose, and then others that weren't, and so on. It was very, I mean, it was so simple, but again, it was so elegant. It was so beautiful. Yeah. And then they figured out, wait a minute, there, there is some kind of, there's a protein in here, we think, that is clamping on to the DNA and preventing these genes that you need to digest lactose yeah. from being read and for proteins being made. Um, yeah. And that was and the first you, time that people realized how you could sort of sh- shut genes off and turn them on. Yeah. And and kind of, I guess so only, another Nobel Prize was one, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that was the early stage, really, of looking at the genome almost like a computer or computer program where you have, um, you know, you can have um, genes whose function is to turn other genes on and off and just get all these layers of um, recursion and, yeah. and complexity. Yeah. And, I, there you know. was, I think there was some influence from the whole cybernetics movement in the 50s. Oh, yeah, there was that old, uh, what was it called, the RNA tie club? And uh, yeah. George Gamoff and those people were, were trying to uh, use information <clears throat> theory to solve the genetic code. Right, and, and, an and there was you know cybernetics was also interested in feedback. And yeah, right, right. Yeah, yeah. So, Robert Weiner. <laughs> right, right. And so you know these things that that were you know that were coming out of computer science or you know designing you know uh, planes or weapons and yeah. and then people were starting to find it, it in biology and um, and so now it's it's I find it interesting because it's come really full circle because. Um, because engineers are, are really coming uh, back to E. coli with a vengeance, um, in part because they they can use some of the rules that they have about control theory and things to not just um, understand how E. coli works, but then to manipulate it in interesting ways. Wow. But I think the most surprising thing I found in your book so far, I've read about two-thirds of it, um, was about um, individuality. And E. coli. I mean, you know, I, I would have thought, without thinking about it too much, that if you had um, had a colony of these these bacteria, and each one had identical genomes, that they would have identical behaviors. But of course, they they don't. And uh, for all these reasons, interesting reasons having to do with the contingency and history of the organism. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. I I think it's a really good. Uh, 
sort of antidote to thinking simplistically about DNA. You know, we, yeah. we, we're so... I think it's really exemplified by cloning and how people people will claim that um, you know uh, making a, a human clone is wrong specifically because um, that person will just be a copy of right. someone right. else that they're not yeah. an individual as if you know your your genome is your ultimate identity. Right. So, yeah. so here we have these bacteria where you have like genetic. Clones. I mean, that's what. That's just how they. They don't have sex, so all you know. They just split in two, and for the most part, they're genetically identical. Yeah. On rare occasion, there's a there's a, um, a mutation that comes in. But even if you're using two, you know that they're two totally identical clones. Um, they can act in very different ways. You know, mm-hmm. so they will. One might um, swim twice as far as another one. Um, to uh, in response to some signal, and so they, you got yeah. fast swimmers and slow swimmers, and then you have ones that will uh, very uh, quickly uh, switch on all their enzymes for digesting lactose, and others will just hold back when you know their alternative is starvation. Um, you you get these weird sort of split decisions. I mean, you yeah. get uh, e-, e. coli like other bacteria, likes to make what's called a biofilm. So in your gut, there's just got, you know, it's lined with E. coli and other bacteria and these little sort of kind of like microbial cities. Um, and some of them in there are just, um, they're sort of like in a coma. It's called, they're, they're, uh, they call it a persistent state. They're persisters. And they're just, they're just not doing anything at all while the others are feeding and growing and reproducing and so on. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, yeah, and it all has to do with the fact that, that the way E. coli behaves is more than just, you know, the information in its genome. It has to yeah. do with, um, there are these feedback loops inside the, these microbes, for example, um, and they're very sensitive. Yeah. And so if they happen to have a little extra of one kind of molecule in them, that could, like, push them off into you know, off very in one direction or in another direction. Yeah, so you get these chaotic kind of nonlinear effects. Right. And then yeah. but what happens is that they then get locked into one of these states. Yeah. Well so, then also anything that you know really happens at that level is always probabilistic, right? So um, you know if you, you have if a if a channel opens to allow ions in, you know, we think of it as being like a little door opening and closing mm-hmm like on a machine, but it's more like um, the probability that the little door will open is increased over what it normally would be. And, that, and you know, so there's all this kind of oscillation between states and, yeah, you know, just things that make it not, not so lockstep. Yeah. I mean, one, one thing that's interesting is, you know, to wonder why it is that, um, you know, why should E. coli uh, have this kind of... Um, you know, circuitry for creating individuals, for having personality, even when they're genetically identical. I mean, if yeah. if there's one good response you should have in some situation, why doesn't don't all the microbes respond the same way? And yeah. there's this really uh, elegant uh, work that's being done to look into how it's probably uh, like bet hedging. So oh, you know, like, oh bet, oh yeah, uh-huh. hedging bets. Yeah, so, you yeah. know, if you knew the future perfectly, uh, you would be very a very good gambler because you'd know exactly, you know, how to bet. Right. You, you know, what horse should I bet on? Who's going to win the – which horse is going to win that race? But you don't, and so sometimes what a lot of gamblers do and, you know, a lot of bankers will do as well is to, to hedge their bets, to sort of spread their bets in different uh, – Oh, yeah. Put and, little bets all over the map and then – right. And then one, you get, if one pays off, it's a it's a big payoff. Right. So if so, oh. these these persister cells I was telling you about that are kind of in this weird coma. Yeah. So they slip into that just because of just because of pure random chance and, and these sensitive feedback loops we were talking yeah. about. Um, so there's always just like maybe one percent at any time are in they are are just persisting. A nice thing about being a persister is that a lot of antibiotics can't kill you, and a lot of other kind of stresses can't kill you. 
they only can really attack growing cells. So, um, so for example, if you take antibiotics, um, they can knock out you know most of an infection, E. coli or some other bacteria. And these persisters are still hanging around, so they're the mm-hmm. ones who survive. Yeah. Um, so yeah. F- for the colony as a whole, it's a, it's a good strategy to, to hedge your bets. Yeah, that's true. If they all behaved identically, it would be very easy to wipe them out. Right, right. Wow, wow. Which, uh, you know, we may think we want to do sometimes if you have an infection, but we don't really, since we're so dependent on them. Yeah, yeah, you don't want to totally clean out your your yeah. uh, little internal jungle there. Um, yeah, yeah. We def- we, I, I write a bit in the book about how, you know, we really depend on it um, in ways that we really are just starting to understand. Yeah, I mean, it's really the exception when you have a, you know, what is it, it's usually hamburger where you read about some hamburger chain someplace poisoning all these people with evil e-, e. coli, and probably all these people who read the articles think, oh, God, E. coli, I'm glad I don't have any of that in my system. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, when I was telling people I was going to be writing a book about E. coli, um, the, their first thought was I was going to be writing about bad Food hamburger. Poisoning. <laughs> But, you know, in a way, it's like uh, it, it, these, I mean, these strains that cause disease, um, they're also just uh, as interesting kind of an entree into <clears throat> these big questions I've been interested in, you know. So what? So for the most part, E. coli comes in strains that are harmless, and some are even good for you. They can actually, like, keep um, disease-causing bacteria out of your, of your gut. Yeah. But... But, you know, you typically, like, through your whole life will have maybe uh, 30 different strains at a time of E. coli that are sort of just living quietly in your gut. There are probably yeah. a billion or a few billion of them in there. Um, but then you have these these uh, these bad actors. And so the one that uh, gets into hamburger is called 0157H7. Um, and then there are a whole bunch of these strains of E. coli that are a lot nastier, but people don't hear about them at least in the U.S., because they just kill people in poor countries. So there's yeah. some strains that, call, that, cause, that are sometimes called Shigella, and they cause kind of a dysentery. <clears throat> oh, right. Uh-huh. And they kill like a million people a year. Yeah. But if you look at, you know, what each one of them does, I mean, they're all E. coli, you know, in this fundamental way. I mean, they, they look like E. coli, they, they, um, they have, you know, this sort of basic backbone of, of the E. coli genome mm-hmm. but then they have uh, hundreds of genes that um, that other strains of E. coli don't have or maybe only some strains do mm-hmm. and so there's it's this incredible mosaic and, and you can see how um, these these disease causing strains have been kind of uh, their genomes have been uh, assembled into their current form a lot a lot of the time through infections with viruses that carry, Toxins, or that carry uh, genes for these uh, needles that the bacteria can use to, you know, puncture your cells and inject stuff to make mm-hmm. you sick. Uh, so it really is. is it's really uh, fascinating because it, it, it's again, it, it gives you a, a little window into how evolution, you know, really works, like yeah. you know, on a global scale. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I'm, I'm sure it's not much comfort to people, you know, who are struggling with, uh, you know, an infection from E. coli. Um, yeah. but, but there's something to be learned. <laughs> yeah. I remember you wrote that um, they tend not to use antibiotics even when somebody has a bad E. coli infection because it, when the um, bacteria die, it can cause these hidden viruses that have been hitchhiking inside the genome to pop out. And yeah, this is, uh, this is kind of gets back to what we were talking about before. Uh, yeah. And this is E. coli... <clears throat> Uh, 0157H7, the thing that infects hamburgers, also the spinach and the lettuce outbreaks people have been hearing about. Uh, so w- one of the viruses that infected them carries a uh, toxin gene. Yeah. And it, it just well, it, that virus DNA will just sit very quietly in the DNA of the bacteria uh, until it detects some kind of stress. <clears throat> and this is pretty. This is pretty common for viruses that infect E. coli. Mm-hmm. They they're just part of its DNA, but they still have these. They can still respond to stress by producing lots of new viruses and breaking out. 
Mm-hmm. You know, so so it, 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 they're they're still in a sense retaining their individuality. Yeah. So and you're so, attacking the bacteria with antibiotics, but that's stressing the virus in there. And then right. So the virus will say, "Well, forget that. I'm out of here," <clears throat> and it and it just it explodes out. And uh, E. coli doesn't just uh, make new viruses, but it makes the toxin that the virus ge- the virus carries. Yeah. And so now you've got this toxin in your system, and that's when things are bad because the toxin yeah. can get into your bloodstream, get into your kidneys, shut them down, and that's when people die. When the, some of the people who die, who get the toxin in their system, they die. That so that's why they don't give them antibiotics. It's it's. Yeah. I was really amazed when I first discovered that. Yeah, I'd never known the the, the specific specific reason, but you know it all kind of makes sense now. Yes, once you get the big E. coli picture, George, you see you're starting it's starting to come into focus, isn't it? No, I mean, light, I, I think I'm starting to understand the mysteries of life. There you go. Just like Francis Crick said when he walked into the to the Eagle Tavern that day, the Eagle Pub, and said, we've discovered the mysteries of life, the secret of life. But a little premature, maybe. You, yeah. you talk about uh, longevity <clears throat> research, too, and I guess E. coli were considered to, to be I- immortal until, until some um, fairly recent... Recent insights. Yeah, uh, so E. coli will. Um, they don't really reproduce the way we do. Um, you know, in the sense that they grow and split, and so now, in a sense, there 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 is no parent left. You had a parent, yeah. and now you have two offspring. So it's it's kind well, of different. Like genetically identical, unless there's mutations. Yeah, and so you know, with us, like <clears throat> you know, we. We're born, we grow up, and then uh, we have children, and then those children live on, and they can have children. Meanwhile, we're just getting older and older and older. Our bodies are falling apart. Yeah. Uh, and this is something that's very, you know, that that you see all over the place. I mean, it, it, some people had sort of thought that it, it, it was um, uh, it was a very common evolutionary strategy, mm-hmm. uh, in the sense that you know you can't. Um, you can't fix all the damage that happens to your cells, so um, a long-term strategy that works in evolution might be to you know, let our bodies get old, and but continually rejuvenate the our lineage with um, but with these germ cells, these sperm and egg that don't have that damage. So when a kid is born, the kid does not <coughs> inherit. All of our, you know, the damage to our aging cells. The kid just starts out, all, you know, fresh and new. I mean, I, you know, see my two girls running around like crazy, and I am always reminded of this. So E. coli and other bacteria just seem like they didn't follow this rule. Um, mm-hmm. But that's just because people haven't looked closely enough at them. Yeah. And it turns it turns out if you look closely at them, you will find if you start with one E. coli. <clears throat> and then just track its descendants, and this is, takes a lot of work. Um, you will find that some of them are reproducing slower and slower and slower, while some of them are just continuing to reproduce at, at top speed. Yeah. And the thing, the key they found is that um, E. coli doesn't. Um, it doesn't. Uh, uh, it, it doesn't rebuild the its ends uh, what are called its poles or these caps at the end of this rod shape I was talking about mm-hmm. so at the end of the um, of the DNA the just DNA? no no at the end of the membrane itself at the end of the membrane okay. yeah so so if if you got one that grows and it stretches and it cuts in half <clears throat> the the oh. two the two poles at the end they just yeah, you, st- have, you have some kind of caps on them right the methyl right and uh, and the the, the pole the, the, you have to build two new poles at where the where the bacteria the microbe got cut in half. Mm-hmm. So now each one of those has a new pole and an old pole. And you if they divide and divide and divide, you get some bacteria with a you know a brand new pole and, and another the other pole might be just one generation old. And then you have others that have a pole that might be you know six, ten, a hundred generations old. And it turns out the older that that the the poles get um, the slower these uh, bacteria reproduce, and 
Uh, the, the, all, there's all sorts of damage that they can see, damaged proteins mm. that pile up. So they're using the same strategy, which is so cool. I mean, they're saying, all right, look, we, there's no... There's no point in all of us trying to desperately repair all of our damage, you know, because yeah, that takes a lot of energy. energy efficient. Right. So yeah. some of you are going to be sort of our, our trash baskets. You know, we're going to yeah. dump all of our damage into some of you E. coli, and others are going to be able to reproduce faster. And so yeah. in the, when, you do, when you do all the math, they come out ahead. Huh. Yeah. Wow, so they're in the same... <laughs> Same boat we are. No yeah. immortality. No immortality. It's, yeah. uh, you can only you know. live on in your good works <clears throat> and your children. But well, you know, or you know, know. Alan said that's not that's not the kind of immortality I want. Right. It's immortality like I live forever and I know about it. Well, you know, it might be some comfort that you know the scientists I talk to say that it might be possible to um, to figure out um, a way to sort of alleviate the damage. That E. coli suffers, because yeah. and then to translate that into um, dealing with human aging. Yeah, yeah. You know, maybe there's some lesson we can learn about extending, uh, you know, youth in E. coli and and apply that to us. Yeah. Now, there's another mo- model of aging, isn't there? That you know, programmed cell death, and it's basically you know the genome is programmed specifically to. <coughs> You know, to, to um, uh, regulate the uh, lifespan. Right. Well, it's um, it, I, it, the way it. Well, it's it's pretty complicated, but the but um, you know, cell death is one way to um. It's one way to deal with this problem of damage. So if cells get too damaged, <coughs> they yeah. can be killed. Or and it's also it's also a way of of dealing with the flip side of this, which is cancer. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, you oh, don't sure. you don't want. I mean, when when you're multicellular, you don't want all your cells going berserk and reproducing full speed. Yeah. You want them to to reproduce when they're supposed to reproduce, and then that's it. So. Yeah. So the reg- yeah, so the regulation. Yeah, so so you in. know our you know our lifespan is the result of all of these these kind of delicate evolutionary balances that yeah. have been playing out for hundreds of millions of years. And yeah. and you know if if E. coli is any guide, then you know this may have been um, uh, something involved with life from you know for three billion years. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's really, you know, kind of vain, I guess, to think that any kind of a structure, I mean, even as complex as E. coli, but much less a human organism would be immortal or, you know, last infinitely. It's, I mean, entropy always wins in the end. Right. I mean, and, and, and no one had really, I guess, really thought too much about um, why it is that E. coli is around? I mean, mm-hmm. uh, if, yeah. if E. coli really was immortal in the sense that you know it could just reproduce and reproduce and reproduce and reproduce, yeah. um, then that would mean that every cell had to <clears throat> fix all of its damage, and that's that's right. a lot of work. I mean, they do fix yeah. lots of damage. You know, you know, they're amazing at how well they can repair yeah. themselves. But yeah, you know, uh, well, yeah, you have little proofreading enzymes yeah. and. Yeah, but yeah, if, the, if there's no overall evolutionary advantage to that, there's going to be limits on how much energy you want to spend on self repair again. So, yeah, so, we we, we sort of we think that you know um, we somehow think that living a long time must be something that would be favored by natural selection, but yeah. that's not really that that could be a byproduct. You know, it, it, it's, it's cultural. Just, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> right, you know what? What you know in, ter- in terms of what natural selection can work on is just sort of how well over the long term different strategies yeah. lead to more offspring. Yeah, it has no reason reason to care how horrifying we find the idea of not existing someday. Right, yeah, right. it doesn't. <laughs> it's not in the business of making us happy, unfortunately. Yes, right. We right, have to do that ourselves. <laughs> yeah. Oh. I noticed I I haven't read the read the chapter yet. I just kind of looked at it, but toward the end you start talking about um, you know E. coli in space and the possibility of of uh, microbes on other other worlds. Yeah, I mean, what what I find really interesting is that um, you know 
the the whole area of what we call astrobiology now actually uh, got some of its uh, first pushes uh, in in the late 50s from uh, people who studied E. coli. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they basically, and then they saw Sputnik go up in space and they said, whoa, wait a minute, uh, what are we doing? You know, maybe we're going to be contaminating the world out, uh, other worlds out there with our spacecraft. And it was Joshua got, Lederberg, right? That's right, Joshua guess, Lederberg, who yeah, discovered I, bacterial yeah. sex. So he was oh. the he was really the guy who made uh, astrobiology happen, uh, exobiology, I guess you could call it. He mm-hmm. he he, um, he he talks about how he was in Australia and you know Sputnik went up and he was looking and he said, "Whoa, we have to we're entering a new age now." Yeah. And so what's what's interesting is I find is that uh, well for one thing it's interesting to wonder uh, just about E. coli like how far has E. coli gotten because you know we carry it wherever we go so it's yeah. definitely it's definitely in space it's got to be on the on the space station you know in yeah. fact they do these little tests for uh, bacteria up there you know in mm-hmm. the in the air and such and and I, I they they found it up there so so E. coli has made it off our planet which I think is pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, and then it survive? So, um, well, I can survive in a space station, no problem. It yeah, probably in, in the space station. Yeah. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. but you know, it, it's it's always conceivable that it, it could have been stuck on one of these Russian probes that crashed into Mars, for example. Yeah. But it probably, you know, it, you, they, they probably would have died pretty quickly. But um, mm-hmm. but you know, there's still there's this great great quote about um, you know someone talking about planetary contamination and saying, you know, we don't want to get to Mars and discover life there and then discover that it's E. coli. Um, so, so E. coli has had this, this, this fascinating uh, it, uh, relationship with, you know, aliens in, in, a, in this funny way. And, and one of the most interesting, uh, thought-provoking ways, I think, is um, the ways in which scientists just here on Earth are playing around with E. coli. You know, they're engineering it, they're tinkering with it, and, you know, a lot of it is just to make it, make better drugs or something, but um, but some of it is just to, to see how far they can push E. coli itself and yeah. to push life. Yeah. So, I don't know if you heard about this stuff where, um, the, you know, so, so DNA, uh, you've got DNA, and DNA encode, uh, there are these genes in DNA that encode proteins, and the proteins are made of these building blocks called amino acids. Mm-hmm. And so we use about 20, and all living things look, use between like 20 and 21 yeah. amino acids. But there are like hundreds they could use, theoretically. Right. Uh, and so people have wondered, well, you know, is it just that life can't exist with these other kinds of proteins? Yeah, we don't... or is it just a lock-in effect? And... Right. Yeah. So people have actually figured out how to make to change that genetic code in E. coli. Oh. So they're making proteins out of amino, amino acids that, it's possible hmm. that no living thing has ever made them out of at least Whoa. nothing on Earth today. Um, so, well, so if we found some something like E. coli on Mars or or elsewhere in space, and it was using a, a different um, amino acid alphabet, but had the same basic uh, structure of uh, nucleic acid replication, that would be a pretty good sign that it probably you know wasn't uh, contamination from Earth, right? It, um, it's possible, yeah. I mean, another thing that that tells you is that <clears throat> you don't want to um, you don't want to constrain your search too much. I mean, yeah. if if yeah. it's if you can make living things uh, on Earth, like E. coli, make proteins out of amino acids that you you never seen before. I mean, you don't want to. There wouldn't be it wouldn't make any sense to say, oh, uh, life could never make proteins out of these amino acids. It's impossible. You know, yeah. it's just might be no we just haven't seen life that does it and the yeah. other thing that they're doing with E. coli is that they are um, they're actually changing the the, um, the letters as it were the nucleotides in the DNA mm-hmm. um, so they used four nucleotides the same way we do but scientists are finding ways to swap in new kinds of nucleotides oh. and the things still live um, yeah so the structure is the same just different individual Parts. Yeah, so, you know, the more that scientists can fool around with E. coli and make it do weird things, sort of the wider we have to sort of cast our net for life on other planets. Yeah, yeah. 
Oh, it's just really, really a fascinating book. I mean, you can see that, you know, in just um, almost an hour, just talking about E. coli, the conversation, you know, just spiraling <laughs> off in all these great directions. And, yeah, I I was I was surprised myself. I mean, I, I when I decided to to uh, take the E. coli path, I thought, well, let's see how this goes. But yeah, yeah. there were just so many uh, cool areas of biology where E. coli is uh, a player. So um, yeah, it's yeah. almost like writing a biography, and then you're really using your protagonist as kind of a a means to explore this uh, whole fascinating territory. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, and, and there are some things that are, you know, can be quite unexpected. So, um, you know, for example, um, you know, E. coli. E. coli was it was at the center, has been at the center of a lot of the uh, conflicts about teaching uh, uh, evolution and creationism in schools. Mm-hmm. You know, it became E. coli and, and these little tales it have became oh, right. sort of, yeah. So the poster child for uh, creationism in its new form, intelligent yeah, design. Yeah, the Discovery Institute loves that. Is that the, the little flagella that uh, they say, oh, this couldn't possibly have arisen in, in right. you know, steps. <laughs> right, because it looks like a motor or it looks like a, a drive yeah. shaft. So yeah. obviously there must yeah, have been some God purpose. obviously knows about motors and drive shafts. <laughs> Yeah, a great designer, but you know, you read a book like yours where, where you really get a sense of what how evolution really works, and just the, you know, the wonderful tension between um, between circumstance and um, and physical law, and just the random factors, and how something will happen accidentally, but if mm. there's an advantage to um, co-opting it into the system for you know improving survival, this will happen. And, yeah, and and a lot of the things that Darwin would write about uh, when he looked at um, you know at, at anatomy, you know, when Darwin would look at a, a human hand and a bird wing and, and a you know a, a dolphin paddle, I mean, he would see the underlying similarities as well as the differences, and yeah. um, you can do the same thing now with something like the flagellum. You know, you can see proteins in that make up this this tail that, that are used in other structures, in E. coli and in other species. And, and yeah. you know, they're, they're used in these smaller structures. And so, mm-hmm. like you say, things could get co-opted and so on. I mean, they can even be sort of um, abandoned after a while. So E. e. coli yeah. actually has... Um, it has genes for making these flagella that really spin, but then it's got these other genes for, for, no, for a different kind of flagellum. Mm-hmm. But they don't work. They don't. They're all dead uh-huh. genes. Uh, yeah, so they lo- lost its advantage. Right. So it's carrying around the, this, these vestiges of um, yeah. of some former set of flagella. Um, ah. and, yeah. And then, the, then they might be recycled into some other structure in the future. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's just so much more beautiful to me than the idea of some, you know. Cosmological designer sitting down at his <laughs> sitting down at his computer and programming all this stuff. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I don't yeah. know why people find that so. Compelling. Well, uh, you know, part of it may be just the way that um, that molecular biology is is um, the way we picture it. Um, so, like, well, we yeah, see, it, is, it often is described in this very mechanistic way, where it yeah. sounds like something that was invented. I, I remember reading. Years ago, it was a two-part series on um, HIV by Robert Gallo, and, mm-hmm. and just reading about all the mechanisms, and it really does, when you translate it into that kind of language, this very mechanistic language, it sounds like you're talking about something that mad scientists could have invented in the government laboratory for <laughs> evil purposes, because <laughs> you lose that whole context. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So... So yeah, so it it just you know the 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 explanation from evolution just is just much more powerful and and yeah. you know it make helps you to understand things that you know scientists discover about E. coli and, and other other things. Um, yeah. Well, that's great. You know, I don't know how long we've been talking because I'm using <laughs> this different software and it that's- only tells me. We've hit, we've hit about an hour. Yeah, well, that's probably a good time to wrap up. Sounds good. Yeah, yeah. well, um, so uh, do you, I guess you have your, your speaking schedule on your website so people can yeah. you know, see where you're, 
where you're going to appear. Actually, in two of the readings that I did over the last two weeks, um, a Blogging Head viewer was in the audience. All right, all right. Well, let's get the <laughs> Blogging Head viewers out for this. Check out my schedule. Yeah, and, yeah definitely. definitely. That would be great to see people. Yep. Good. Well, Carl, it was great talking to you. We should do this more often. Absolutely, yeah. Excellent. It was an excellent talk. Thanks. Okay, good luck again with the book. All right, take care. Okay, bye.